Welcome to Conflict Management in the Workplace, a webinar produced by Pierce College Center for Career and Professional Development and Pierce College Center for Male Engagement. We are so excited to have you all here today uh, and welcome Dr. Veronica Hawkins, who will be leading us through this conversation. Um, we are very excited to talk about this. It's something that we all encounter, and I think that we can you know, all benefit from this conversation. Um, the Center for Career and Professional Development is a place where Pierce students and alumni get a chance to work one-on-one -on -one with career development counselors to set up a career action plan that's individualized to suit each person's needs, their background, their experience, their interests, where they want to go, and to help build a structure to reach those goals as they get their degrees and beyond that as well. Um, we are really excited to have our students and alumni be able to work with our career counselors. We are also really excited to provide a variety of resources, online resources, as well as uh, events like this webinar tonight. Um, so if you are a peer student or an alum, and this is your first time meeting with the Center for Career and Professional Development, we're so glad that you're here. If this, if you're one of our are people that we see all the time. We're so glad to see you too, um, because everyone we, you know, you're part of the Pierce family. So I'm gonna say, Terrence, can you tell us a little bit about the Center for Male Engagement? Thank you so much, uh, Leslie. And um, this is such an amazing opportunity. Um, I think the opportunity to collaborate is so powerful. And um, I think today, everyone who's gotten on, I wanna salute each and every one of you for taking some time to, uh, emphasize and prioritize your personal and professional development, because this really is going to overlap and add value in every space possible. Uh, so for me, a quick introduction, I am the Director of Academic Enrichment, leading the Center for Male Engagement, and it's founded on DEIB um, practices, that's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and we're really looking forward to this really amplifying sense of belonging for everybody. Uh, when I say everybody, I mean everybody. However, there is a special focus on programming for our men of color. And I want us to all kind of be on the um, lookout for events that come up. Um, and there are many of you on the call today um, on this Zoom call who have attended some of our events. Um, and I'm so excited to announce that um, as the year continues, uh, we're going to have many different events that are going to be offered in person, um, as well as virtually, um, that will not have any boundaries on who is able to attend because this is all about collaboration. It's all about community. And uh, we're really looking forward to those opportunities that will emerge. Um, once again, just just, just uh, restating and, and um, echoing the sentiments that Leslie said, conflict management is such a great topic for right now. Um, there are so many conflicts that are just um, in our scope. Um, I would even, um, without without going too far into it, uh, if any of you have followed Cat Williams, right? That's nothing but conflicts, right? <laughs> so, um, but even if we look overseas, there's conflicts overseas that we're watching, right? Conflicts, and it's just so many different spaces. Some of you have conflicts with the person that you're in house with right now, right? So, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to the presenter, the presentation, and everything that's going to come out of this time. And uh, with no further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew. Thank you, Terrence. Um, yeah, this is this is exciting. I love these these opportunities to collaborate and to work with our departments. I'm really excited about this speaker. It's a great topic, very relevant topic, just like you said, Terrence. Um, whether it's workplace or personal. Um, so Dr. Veronica Hawkins has been in the HR field for over 25 years, um, and HR is a pretty big umbrella that includes operations, leadership, talent management, organizational development, and she actually does her own consulting. Um, she was the 2023 Delaware Valley HR Person of the Year. Um, she serves on a number of national boards and committees. Um, she did her master's in education with a concentration in training and development, and her PhD was actually focused on workforce education and development, um, specifically team development and effectiveness. So uh, we have a, a really, really exciting expert on the topic uh, in her free time. Dr. Hawkins is a driving enthusiast. Um, you'll see her. Uh, tuning the world out and tuning the conflicts out while behind the wheel um, dri driving in, uh, is, is, is her happy place. So um, I will pass the baton over to Dr. Hawkins. Thank you again for being here and take it away. 
All right. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for that. Today's driving was a little bit treacherous. I will say, Andrew, I was being very careful today. I was not, you know, I was not out there living my best life in my little two-hour car. Uh, today, I was being very cautious. But thank you so much to the Pierce College administration team and faculty for reaching out and setting up opportunities like this so that we could have a conversation. So a couple of rules of the road for tonight. I do not have all the answers, although I have a PhD behind my name. That just means that I can take a lot of stress and I know how to research stuff, right? So that doesn't mean I have all the answers. What I will do is I will facilitate a conversation tonight. And we have some great people on the call, all of you. And I will give you the opportunity to steer the conversation around topics that are most important to you within this conflict management sphere or circle. Um, so that's that's the first thing. Secondly, as you have questions, please do either drop them in the chat or raise your hand or come off the mute. I much prefer to take questions as they as they arise instead of you trying to go back and re go back to the information. So please feel free again. We are all adult learners. Please jump in. No adult likes to be told to wait to the end, or at least maybe that's just my lack of patience. It could be just me. Um, but again, jump in with your questions as you have them. All right, so let's keep our conversation going for the night. So I do not have permission to share this picture. This is me and my family. Yes, I did have hair at one point in time. My daughter became a teenager and I cut all my hair off because it was just a lot. Um, but this was us 10 years ago, actually. We are a blended family. Um, so it's my husband and our two boys and our daughter. And like I said, this picture was 10 years ago and they would kill me if they knew I showed this picture. But they are the reason why I do what I do. This is my why, right? So sometimes you really need to understand the person who's talking to you and a little bit about beyond the car and beyond the, the PhD and beyond the companies. Who am I talking to and what gives her the right to have conversations with me about conflict? But a blended family moving from, I'm from Pennsylvania, my husband's from Memphis, Tennessee. So you've got the North and the South blending. You've got the stepkids blending. You've got the boys and girls. And then there's a dog somewhere around here, which may or may not come barreling in the room and jump up and wave. Just ignore him if he does all of that. Um, if any of my family does that, I'll kill them later. But either way, this is who I represent and these are my why. This is why I get up and do what I do because I want my children to have an understanding of how to navigate through life successfully. Not that I am that ultimate pinnacle of success, but that I'm trying to show them ways to be successful. So a little bit more about me because at this moment it is about me, let's be honest. So a couple of things, again, I like for people to understand who am I and, and get, what gives me the right to come and talk to you. But more importantly, so as you can tell, this was more recently. Yes, I did dye my hair as well. So I never keep things the same. You can tell I hate change, right? Um, so this was just this past year. We took our, our daughter, our youngest, on a tour to the best school ever. Yes, that is the Nittany Lion because I am a three times Penn Stater. So yes, I am here with Pierce College, but I'm a Penn Stater in my, in my soul and trying to get my daughter to say yes to Penn State if she heard me. Um, so a couple of things. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, yes, we are Penn State. Absolutely, James. We are we are rocking together. Um, so what do you think my favorite movie is? So you heard a clue. You heard a little bit of a clue earlier in Andrew's opening, but just drop it in the chat. A, B, C, or D. Which one do you think is my favorite movie? All right. Oh, Chris is going out on the limb. She's like, no way. I'm, I'm gonna I'm not gonna fall for it. All right. I got some options out there. Okay. So I will tell you, my favorite movies are all of them. I am an action junkie, right? Like I am car chase, gunfight. I want to see somebody getting their nose bloody. I don't see horror though. Like I'm a scaredy cat at night. I'm checking all the windows and the doors. So let's be clear. But if it's a car chase, like a car jumping from building to building, I am so into that. John Wick, one of my favorites. The fourth one, and not so much if you didn't see it, just wait till it comes on Netflix. But these are some of my favorite movies. I love a good action scene. I love a good fight scene. And yes, I may try out some of those moves on my poor unsuspecting husband, least at when he's least expecting it. That's probably me. All right. So more about me. Oh, uh, now I showed you. So my favorite meals of the day, breakfast and dessert. Start me off with a good breakfast and then give me something sweet at the end of the day. And I'm going to be your BFF for life. And we can go shoe shopping in between. We're going to get along just great. So. Favorite movies, favorite meal of the day. Drop it in the chat. What do you think is my favorite dessert, though? Because I can be brought with shoes, 
for sweets, in case you were wondering, I can be bribed on those. So what do you think is my favorite dessert? Let's see. See, bread pudding, okay. Ice cream, all of the above. Got some 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 smart ones, some smart ones out there. I also went to Penn State, and if you know about the Penn State Creamery ice cream, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So I will tell you, B, C, and D. I do not like chocolate. Like I like do not ever. I know Leslie, don't faint. Like I, I probably should have Andrew. She's gonna be like never invite her back now. But I do leave more chocolate for those who like chocolate. But if you make me a carrot cake bread pudding with a scoop of vanilla ice cream or caramel ice cream, oh, we are going to get along great. Absolutely great. So as you can see, food and fast cars are like the weight of my heart. There you go. So that's a little bit about me personally. You know about my family. You know about some of my tastes. And then let's talk about my professional credentials, right? Like, how, like what gives me the right beyond the PhD to come in and have this conversation? I started out my career a long time ago in the 90s as an agricultural business major. Yes, I went to Penn State. I drank the agricultural Kool-Aid, right? And I am from North Philadelphia, so it's not like I grew up on a farm. I hadn't seen a farm until I went to Penn State. And then I spent every year on a dairy farm. It was like, oh, this is where milk comes from. This is interesting. Very, very interesting. And I learned to milk cows and talk about forage samples and nutritional value of various forage. And I was like, oh, this is, a, this is interesting. So my first job was at New Holland. It's an agricultural uh, equipment company out in New Holland, Pennsylvania, which is in Lancaster County. And then I've worked my way around a number of companies doing a number of different things. So yes, I cut my teeth in business operations. However, my credentials, my Penn State, my education has been really around understanding adult learners, understanding how to get people to work together toward a common goal, particularly when you talk about profitability or marketing plans or safety components. So I've spent time at some of the biggest companies. I worked at Target when it was Target and it was super cool. Absolutely. Um, I will tell you, if you like Starbucks um, and you like Target, I opened up one of the first prototypes that had the Starbucks in it. So we were on the first, I, and I had to be Starbucks certified. And I was like, for the love of God, why are there so many steps in this coffee? Like I couldn't figure it out. And now I'm completely hooked on coffee. But these are some of the places that I've been able to cut my teeth and learn about conflict management, learn about team development, learn that if you can get people to get together and talk about a common goal, even though they have widely different backgrounds, these are the places where I've learned to do those things and do those things well. And I've worked across the country in most of these spaces, uh, being able to do that. And I will say, do it quite successfully. So that's my, my professional background. Um, if you call any of these places, I had 17 different names. So if you go to Memphis, Tennessee, though, and you go to Target, don't ask for Veronica, ask for VC, because that's the only name, because they kept calling me the wrong name. So they kept calling me Valerie, Vanessa, Victoria. And so I finally shortened my name tag to just V and C. And that was it. And that's how we got along swimmingly. But either way, so this is my background. Now, all of this has taken a bit of risk and decision making, even to get through school, to navigate through various jobs. And you may be asking yourself, well, how does this all tie into conflict management? It ties into conflict management because in any time you're making a decision to move forward, to do something different, to be in a space, to represent yourself, there is a bit of risk. And there's a bit of decision making that has to occur for those things to work well. And so these are some of the foundational parts that goes into the formula for being successful with conflict. Most people shy away from conflict. I am one of those very rare, weird birds that's like, but let's lean in. Let's like, let, let's get into it, right? If we're going to have conflict, let's be good at it. Let's not shy away from it. So we'll come back to this in a moment. Before I get too far down the road, um, there are a couple of things that I tend to do when, I, when, I, when I'm in spaces like this. And I like to tell people about the shoulders of people that I stand on. And no, these are not my ancestors. It would be really cool if they were, though. Like, that would be amazing. On my left is Dr. Edward Boucher. And he is the first man of African descent in the United States to earn a PhD. He earned his PhD in 1876 from Yale University, and he taught chemistry and physics. And so I pay homage to the, one of the first people who allowed me to earn my PhD. 
On my right is Dr. Sadie Tanner Mosel Alexander, and I have a deep, fond connection and affection for this person. She is one of the first African American women to earn a PhD in the United States. Also, she was one of the first women to earn a JD, a Juris Doctorate, and she earned both degrees from the University of Pennsylvania right here in our fair city of Philadelphia. I have an additional affection for Dr. Alexander because she and I also share a sorority connection. She is one of the founders of the sorority that I ultimately joined in school. But I always like to tell people when you're talking about conflict, sometimes you've got to step back and recognize to who you are and where you gather your strength from and where you bring your credentials from, but also whose shoulders you're standing on. So I always like to drop a little bit of history lesson into the things that I'm doing, and it drives my children absolutely crazy. But now you have a bit of tip information. All right. So I borrowed this, this statement from Andrew when Andrew contacted me and asked me about presenting this topic. And I was like, well, you know, kind of tell me what's the tagline? What are we talking about? And he said, disagreements are inevitable, but they don't need to turn into stressful conflicts. And I really, really liked that, right? Because again, they are inevitable. And so if you know something is inevitable, let's prepare for it. Let's not be caught off guard. Not, let's not be like, oh, oh my gosh, some show shock conflict occurred. No, it's going to happen. It's going to happen with children. It's going to happen with adolescents. It's going to happen as adults. It happens in your personal life. It happens in your professional life. But how about we take some time to be prepared for when it happens, right? So it's not an if, it's a when, it's a how. And it's a let's be prepared for it, kind of like the icy stuff outside as I asked my husband to buy some ice milk just in time. God bless Amazon. It came just in time uh, so that we weren't doing the ice capades down our driveway uh, this morning. So that's going to be tonight's conversation is how do we make sure that although disagreements and conflict is uncomfortable, it doesn't always have to be so stressful. All right. One more slide, and then I'm going to ask for some participation. I am that kind of person that always looks up the word of the, like, what's the word that we're talking about, right? So conflict. And there's multiple definitions of conflict out there. But I like the one that I've underlined in red. And it's an incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles, or interests. It's an incompatibility between two or more opinions, principles or interests. Notice it doesn't say people, right? There, there's no people in there. So the conflict doesn't, even though you're in conflict with each other, most times it's not about me or you. It's about something that it's a, it's a, it's a thing between us. And so I also feel like if you can sometimes make conflict less personal, you can take yourself out of it. Sometimes it makes it a bit more, um, you can neutralize it a bit better. All right. So before we get started, and yes, my I'm one of those people, my slides are all over like, what the world kind of slide is that? This is what I want to know from you all. You, most of you, you all registered and signed up for this amazing webinar that you get to go to for free. So how awesome is that? So that's amazing. But what I really like to know is what are some of your questions that you have around conflict? What are some of the topics you want to talk about? And so feel free to either drop it in the chat or you can come off of mute. And if you, if we have multiple people, how do we want to do this? If you want to come off mute, would you mind raising your hand? And then one of our wonderful um, peers administrators can help call on you. But I'd love to hear what's on your mind because that will make the most interesting. Yes, Crystal is my new favorite. She went first. I love it. All right, Crystal, I called uh, you because I saw your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal Carson. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. And my question for you, Ms. Veronica, is how do you look at conflict as just an opinion or a disagreement and not as an individual or that person instead? Yep. So one, thank you, Crystal, for coming off mute. I love when people come off mute and have the conversation because then I feel like I'm just not talking to myself. Um, so the question, if I could, if I, if I heard it correctly, is how do you not make it personal? Right. How do you make it about the thing, the process, the task, the decision, as opposed to the person? And so a couple, so before I weigh in, 
Um, and again, I don't have all the magic answers. I love to see if anyone else has an answer for that. Like, how do you, if you've done this in the past, how do you make conflict not personal? How do you keep it about the opinion or the decision or the issue? Any experience out there with this? All right, Francis. Thank you. Um, in past scenarios, I'll say, um, I think that one of the things that helped me to be successful in this area and trying to get, because it's very important to be heard and the instances, and this is primarily when I'm volunteering. So, and there's a conflict, some, you know, um, you see it a lot in urban settings that folks that do not live in the communities want to go into the communities and tell people what, you know, the residents um, of that community what to do and do not listen. And I observed that scenario or engagement so often that I always pose the question, well, do you even know where I ask? Do you even know what what the problem is? What you know what they would like, what the need is, and you know depending on the the situation, and every single time I could very easily see how um, there was no listening, um, and it also applies to my experience in sales. I had to listen to get to the bottom and the nitty gritty of what it is that they needed, wanted, and who the the decision maker was right so you sort of kind of I applied those skills to this scenario and then I was able to get a lot I'm not saying all I wasn't always successful but at least when you you know when there's this conflict everyone is heard and at that point just to use some of the language that you use you have that common you bring folks to a common good or a common ground and then you can move forward because then everyone has Everyone has been heard, knows that they've been heard, and they also know that they are part of that buy-in and to get to the bottom resolution, whatever that may be as well. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And I love that, like you said, you, you've, you've tried it in a multitude of scenarios and conflict happens, right? So whether it's in community involvement or whether it's in sales. And then Sherry said she tries to see things from everyone's perspective and tries to make sure to not take things personal or make it about her. Listening is a skill that she has. And again, same thing about listening. The other thing I would say, in addition to listening, because you have to listen first, is restate what you believe the conflict is, right? So if if we're having this conversation, what, what I'm hearing you say is you didn't like um, the way that the process happened. And so it's not, you, I don't like you, or you don't like me, it's, or you disagreed with, or we were not in agreement with, so that's even more neutral language, we were not in agreement with how the decision was made. Therefore, it's no longer a Veronica issue, or a Francis issue, or a Sherry issue. And a Sherry, if I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me. And then Guillerme, Guillerme said, I think an important factor is not to take, not make the conflict personal. Again, so if you can state what you believe the issue is, that depersonalizes it or it helps to depersonalize it. Hey, um, I disagreed with that we use the color blue. Now there are blue in my house come up because I'm a Penn Stater, let's be clear. Um, so my husband's colors are green and orange, not even happening anywhere in the house, right? But we can have a disagreement about that. But just stating what the issue is, um, we if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the email did not go to the correct audience. So again, just stating what you believe the issue is can help depersonalize it. Wonderful. Crystal, did that did that help there? You can give me a thumbs up or type in the chat or come off mute. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, everyone. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I do want to, um, is there any, one, I can take one more here. Is there another topic or question that someone has that we want to delve into together? I have one, if I may, um, and thank you. Not so much of making it personal or not, but the delivery. Um, the delivery and not to be dismissive with that delivery, but also being clear, you know, um, when you make the point of reiteration, um, I and I'm going to make this person, this part personal and some of the folks on the call understand this. I seem to be, or I know that I'm very clear, try to be direct to the point. 
I, you know, I'm, I'm smiling. I've been smiling ever since I logged in. So, um, you know, nod my head in agreement and, you know, and that sort of thing. But it's sometimes even with that smile, the delivery is not accepted or taken well or received well. And I think that sometimes I need to be, um, I don't know, I'm still working on that. I'm, pol I'm still working on the polishing that uh, this gem. So if you can touch on some delivery skills, maybe, or I don't know, uh, methods, maybe, at least one. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to jump right into this one because, uh, Francis, I will tell you, um, I am known for being direct. I don't like a lot of fluff. Just tell me straight, no chaser. I don't need all your, your accolades. I just want to know what the, the issue is to go after and solve it. But what I was told early on in my career around my delivery, one, because I was from the North and I was moving to the South. I was in Memphis, Tennessee, in Biloxi, Mississippi, in Little Rock, Arkansas. One, I had to be aware of the context. I had to be aware that um, people were talking more slowly than I was. And so maybe my fast, my fast cadence and my, 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 you know, my North Philly, Philadelphia swag wasn't always in the best interest of the group who was trying to receive the information. And then I honed in on comedy. I honed in on comedy and, and I honed in on understanding who my team was. So at one point in time, I had over 300 associates reporting into me. And what I had to do was make a note about something about each of my associates. So if I had to go give them and deliver something that maybe wasn't the most fun news to be delivered, I had to find a way to tie it into them, right? So just what Andrew did, he and I talked about cars. We talked about cars a little bit earlier this week and that I like Fast and Furious. If you can tie something into a person's personal family, you know, they like Penn State, they like Temple, they like Drexel, they like Pierce College, they're Eagles. We're not going to talk about the Eagles tonight. Just It's just too soon for my emotions right now. Um, but tying it into something along with the smile, right? Along with the gestures, helps them kind of diffuse it, right? They say, okay, Frances knows me. She knows I have two kids and I have a 17 year old that's probably down there scarfing down the last of the brownies even though I was planning on eating those. So I've learned that if you if you make something personal, um, as far as a positive thing, right? Talking about their family or, right? hey, I know you, your anniversary was the other weekend or whatever it is, finding a way in to make that personal connection along with the smile and the nonverbals can really diffuse things up front. And then, um, and you said you use that in your sales days. Absolutely, right? That's a great sales technique is you're trying to remember something about every single person that you're interacting with. And listen, our brains aren't that big. We have these little magic etch sketches now. I put notes in people's contacts so I could never share people's contacts because I got all kinds of notes in there that I can't share. I can just share the phone number because I make notes so that I can remember. But that's one way that I've uh, approached things. And then comedy, I am I, I am not the funniest person, even though I think I'm absolutely hilarious, but I've learned a little bit of comedic timing through just not being so serious. I can tell you that you're not doing a great job, or I can tell you that we're having a disagreement, but I can still make it fun. I've had to separate with people from employment and they gave me a hug afterwards. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to stab me as soon as they hug me. And they weren't, they didn't, right? They were like, listen, I appreciate that you were very humane about that. So making it personal, keeping all your wonderful nonverbals. And I feel like you'll have a winning formula with that. Awesome. All righty. So I do what I'm going to, I'm going to keep moving, but as your questions come up, please do not stop. So there's two schools of thought in my scary place that's called my head around conflict management. There's a textbook, which I'm going to share a few pieces of textbook information that I did not create. I stole it from someone else on the internet. So let me just go ahead and be clear. Don't come after me like they did for uh, Professor Gay. I did not write this. I'm just letting you know now. And then there's VC's world and I am VC in case you all forgot. And so my perspective of how I deal with conflict management. So from a textbook, a couple of things. I borrowed this off of the internet because I really like the way this person put together this graphic, right? So it talks about there's four types of conflict, and then the and then they talk about options for dealing with the conflict, and then they really dig into how to address it directly. And so we're going to pull this apart for a few minutes, and then we'll go into what I call VC's world. And again, if you have questions, feel free to come off of mute or drop it in the chat. So let's just jump into it. And I will tell you, these were not the most clear images, but I was, you know, I was copy and pasting um, around this, but I'm hoping that it's not too awful on your eyes. When we talk about conflict, and we've mentioned some of these already, 
there's basically four types. And if you're a researcher, you could dissect these into a million types of conflict. Mostly in the area, there's four. There's relationship, task, status, and process. When it comes to work, there is no magic formula about where conflict happens, right? It could be that someone that you honestly just don't get along with a coworker and it's about the personal feeling of it, right? They ate your salad out of the lunch room and you know Margaret ate it and now you've got conflict with Margaret, right? That's a personal thing. But then there's task conflict and that's what happens a lot in workplace and it's who's, who's doing what, right? Does someone do what they were supposed to do in the workplace or the classroom? Um, if you Google me, my research was on um, team effectiveness specifically, how to make student teams more effective and hence students. Um, and one of those ways we looked at making student teams more effective was putting a team charter in place when you get together and do those lovely team projects that every teacher and professor likes to give you is a team project. I hated team projects and I wrote my dissertation on them. But either way, but a lot of tasks are about what should be done. And in my household process, conflicts reign supreme. Nobody does things the way I want them to do. I'm like, if I ask you to do something, I just want you to go in my head, figure out how I want it done and do it that way. And we know that's not possible, right? Now they should know me well enough to know that if I say clean the kitchen, that means wash the dishes, sweep the floors, mop down, you know, wipe down the counters, wipe down the microwave. So in my house process conflicts, how things happen tend to be a little bit fuzzy for us in my house. And then there's status conflicts. And that tends to happen when you have either really small organizations or really flat organizations because everybody's doing a little bit of everything. So these are just four types of conflict that you typically can find yourself in. And again, there are so many more flavors that fits within these four flavors. So options for managing conflict. And again, this one's a little fuzzy. Um, you could do nothing and see if it resolves itself. Now. How many times have you not done anything about conflict and it just magically worked itself out? Raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Anybody? You just magically did nothing and the conflict just went away like, poof, it just. Yeah, that doesn't tend to happen, right? So that, that doesn't tend to happen. You can address it indirectly and that's passive aggressive communication, right? So if my if I go downstairs and I, and I wanted the kitchen clean, um, as I just looked at my 17 year old to get her to hit because the kitchen should be clean like she's right there. Um, and I go downstairs and it's not clean to my liking. And I say, oh, my gosh, if only I could get someone to clean the kitchen appropriately. That's kind of like indirectly addressing it. That's not really fair to that person that I'm talking to, right? So that's an indirect way or passively communicating with that person. I'm going to skip over addressing directly because we're going to come back to that. Now, hear me say this. There may be times when conflict becomes so caustic, it becomes so detrimental to your health, to your grades, to your finances, that you need to exit the relationship. And that happens. So do know not every conflict is going to be resolved. And sometimes you have to pack your toys and go home. And that's okay. I'm hoping that you'll work through conflict management before you get to that decision. But sometimes that is the decision that's going to be best for you and your mental health, your family's health, your grades, your finances, whatever that is. So do know if you're in conflict, don't just say because Veronica said I just got to work it out. No, if it's just getting untenable, it's becoming unsolvable. There are about to be throwing of hands. Just walk away and maybe it's time to pack your toys and go home. But let's talk about addressing it directly. Um, this was this is one of my favorite parts of the slide and why I caught this person's slide so much. We talked about establishing a shared goal earlier. If you're in conflict with someone, you can say, hey, Bob, Sue, Corinne, whatever it is, I noticed that we are not working together effectively. And my goal is to work together. Or my goal is for us to get this project done. Or our goal is to make money. Or our goal is to maximize our bonus. Our goal is to get a good grade on the project. Whatever the thing is of why you're in this team or relationship with that person, try to find a common goal that you can both agree on. We're trying to get a good grade in this project. Can we agree on that? Yes, great. That's the foundational part right there. One of the things that 
that I that I have seen be very effective is asking that person for advice. Okay, so we're trying to get a good rate. I think it should be, you know, I'm trying to do it this way. You're trying to do it that way. This person is over here. How about we put ourselves in each other's shoes and ask each other for advice? If I am the driver driver, I want projects done early. I want them done on, like I want it done early so I can move on to something else. But I may have someone in my project team that is, is a bit of a procrastinator because they have 17 other things they're working on. So I may ask that person, listen, by when can you get that part done? So sometimes I have, or, or how do you, if I need to get it done now, how do you think we could work together a bit more effectively? What advice would you give me if I'm the driver driver? Other times I am a person that likes space. If we're in conflict and it's emotional conflict, I will walk away. I need a minute because if it's here and it comes out here, it's probably not going to be nice. I just know myself, right? to thine own self be true. So if you need, if you're the person, see Francis, I see you're laughing. Um, if you're the person that needs to, you know, let the, let it simmer down a little bit before it goes on 10, don't be afraid to take a break, but tell the person, don't just walk away or don't just unplug. Say, hey, you know what? I need a bit of time to really process how I'm thinking and feeling. Might we get together in 30 minutes, tomorrow, next week, whatever your time will allow, but let that person know, hey, I really need to think about how to move forward. And I just need a little bit of space. That's a really adult way to approach it. And so I have had to learn that in my own marriage and say, hey, I'm a thinker. I like the process and I want to play out the conversation. I want to see what you're going to, I'm like playing mental chess in my head. And then I want to have a conversation. So again, Francis, I see you're laughing at me. We're going to, I'm going to call you later. Okay. And then the other part is you can always find a neutral party. And I would say, don't make your professor, your teacher, your neutral party, because they get tons of other people trying to pull on them. Try to find someone maybe in your career center, or if you have a student mediation center, find someone that both of you can work with and trust to help you kind of pull out some of these pieces around the conflict. So these are four tactics that you can use, and it's not linear. You don't do one and the other than the other. You may have to do one and try the third and then go to the fourth and go back to the first. But these are just some tips you can have available to you around addressing conflict directly. And then again, as I started in the beginning of this conversation, think positively about conflict, right? Don't be like, oh my gosh, I, I just, I just want to just not, like I want to hide, I want to put my head under the sand. No, let's know conflict's going to happen. And it's not all bad, right? We can get much better outcomes if we work through the sticky situation. And I heard Terrence talk about DEIB earlier. That's one of the benefits of diversity is that when you're able to work, work through it, then you're able to come up with much better ideas. There are times where I present something to my husband and he'll come back and say something. And I'm like, I don't really. Oh, that is a good idea, right? If I, if I keep my mouth quiet enough, sometimes I'll be like, oh, that's a really good idea he just came up with. Or he added on to what I was thinking and made it even better. And my 17 year old does the same thing. Sometimes it's bringing all those ideas together and working through it to get to a much better end, end result. People who are able to manage conflict well tend to have higher job satisfaction, tend to have higher student satisfaction, tend to have better grades at the end of the semester because you are able to work through those issues. And then overall having better relationships. So these four things are some, are some ways if you lean into conflict well, these are outcomes that I believe we all can have. So I'm gonna pause there before we go into VC's perspective around some conflict management tools. Questions or comments about anything we've shared in the last few minutes? All right. I don't see any, so I'm going to keep moving, but don't be afraid to jump in. So back to VC's world. A couple of things. I've talked about preparing for the journey, right? Know that conflict is going to happen. Just know it. If you're married, you're dating, you've got kids, what two-year-old is not wrought with conflict when you try to tell them they can't paint the wall purple? Like it, it happens, right? Conflict is going to happen. And so a couple of things, thinking about the prior four things that we talked about of being prepared for conflict. But in my world, one of the things I like to do, and let's talk about it in a student perspective now, is being prepared. Read your syllabus. Make notes on it. Like when you get your class at the beginning of the semester, hint, hint, we're at the beginning. 
of the semester, read the syllabus, and make sure that you're not caught off guard. Make sure that you understand what your teacher or your professor is asking for. If you're being put into a group setting, proactively reach out to the students that's gonna be on your team. If you're in work conflict, think about, hey, I've, been, I've just been assigned this project at work. And I know the last time I worked with Mickey Mouse, it was real difficult. So let me just go ahead and get ready now. So, and the other part is know what your triggers are. If somebody is late, I'm immediately on like an 8.5, not a 10. But if you're not valuing my time, I'm on an 8.5. So how I mediate that is I let people know, hey, I'm really time sensitive. And so if you're going to be late here, all my phone numbers, the way you can contact me, you don't even have to call me, just text me and let me know. So those are things that I try. I try to give people forewarning. I, I don't like being late. I don't like parking in Center City. So if you're inviting me to something downtown, I will Uber. Like I need to know about the parking situation, right? So know yourself, know your triggers, be prepared for the things that can make you conflict. Splitting a check, I go out to dinner with friends. I am in the text message. Hey guys, the plan is to split the check evenly regardless of what you order. So come prepared, right? So if you think about conflict that can happen, I'm just trying to give you some nuggets along the way because you know what your triggers are. I don't want to be sitting there counting pennies at the table at Del Frisco's when I just had a lovely steak and now I heard someone, well, I didn't order the mushrooms. Well, you, listen, we said up front, we split a check no matter what. So be prepared for the journey. Secondly, be clear. I think Francis said that earlier, be intentional. Know who you are. And if you are a person who can go from zero to 10 very quickly, Tell people, you know what, I, I, I am a person who needs time to process. If I say something now, I might, I might, be, I might get myself in trouble. For my friends that are um, time flexible, that time is a relative term to you, if you know that, let your friends know up front, right? So be clear and be intentional about your strengths and your opportunities. If you want someone to do math, do not call me. Don't have me trying to divide the checkup at the end of dinner. I'm going to try to figure out my calculator. I don't even know where my calculator is in this phone. So then that's a whole other thing because now I'm on Google instead of Apple. That's a whole drama in my life. But being clear and intentional. Be intentional about how you communicate. Read your emails out loud before you hit send. Think about if you know you tend to speak with a little bit of a sharp tone, you probably write with a sharp tone. So you may want to read your emails and be like, oh, that could sound a little something, something, right? So being clear, being intentional, and being and, and knowing who you are in when you get into conflict and know how to get out of conflict. Don't be afraid to say sorry. For my female friends, men, please close your ears for a moment. I'm going to be sexist for about a whole 37 seconds. For my females on the call, please stop apologizing if it was not your fault. Don't apologize for somebody else's issue. If somebody was late, let them own that. We as women, and the research does show, we as women tend to apologize profusely too much. We tend to apologize when it's not our opportunity to, to fix it or we didn't create the issue. So if, but if it's your fault, do apologize and be sincere about it. So be clear, be intentional, know yourself. Francis, is your hand up? If I may, and I'll ex excuse myself from the, for the gentleman, this is also tagging um, to your comment to, to us um, females. Um, the other thing, I think that there's a, uh, an example that I learned, it was pointed out to me because instead of saying, excuse me, like if I was in, I don't know, in the store and trying to get by someone or whatever, I would say, I'm sorry. And someone was um, gracious enough to say, you shouldn't apologize. What you need to be saying is, excuse me, because guess what? They're in the way kind of thing. Um, and I think it, it ties into what you just said. And it is something that we, for whatever reason, are, learn or taught or whatever. So that was just one of those little razzle dazzle sprinkling things that I wanted to add to your comments. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Yep, absolutely. There is, look it up. There is tons of research on how um, genders the gender line and what and how you identify even as a gender and how you use the word sorry or you apologize. If you're late, again, that's something that you want to make sure you're, you're, you're taking the onus for. But even in then, I say, you know what, I appreciate you being willing to wait for me. Again, I'm owning it. 
but as but I, but I will tell you that we tend to take on things and particularly in conflict, we go into this, let me make everybody happy mode. But that's another conversation for another day. We can do another us, um, another seminar on that. But be clear and be intentional. This is one of my favorite ones here. Take the risk. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Call someone out respectfully. Call them in respectfully. Call them in. Don't call them out or call them in in front of other people. But take the risk. Say, hey, Terrence, I noticed the other day when we had the conversation, you didn't quite see yourself. Is there something that made you uncomfortable? Is there something that you know you didn't agree with? Be okay with being uncomfortable. If somebody brings something to your attention, don't, oh, it wasn't me, that's just on you. No, let me let reflect on that, right? So lean in. Managing conflict is not one of those things we are taught with reading, writing, and arithmetic. I don't even know if they still teach it that way. You're definitely not teaching cursive anymore. Um, but leaning into conflict isn't a skill that we are taught as children. It's sometimes taught in college, but we're all forced to deal with it. So take the risk, check in with yourself. Have you done everything you could on your part? And then call your colleague, email them. I personally say don't email. Actually, let me, I'm going to take, er, don't email, pick up the phone because conflict can be exacerbated via written text, via, via written email, because you can't read the tone, right? You can't read it. I'm going to stop there. And I see Andrew's hand. I just, I, I want to say in my experience, in my career, this one, it, it may feel uncomfortable in the beginning, but oftentimes this can build up. If you don't take the risk and you're not willing to make it a little uncomfortable, maybe even a little painful, if you're you know, allergic to conflict, it, if it'll build up and build up until it turns into something that's even more painful than just a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, it's interesting. I was in an a, a interview earlier today and I was talking to a person and I asked them how they like to give feedback, right? How do they give feedback to their team for improvement? And one of the things he said is he said, if I give feedback in real time, as close to real time as possible, it's only this big, this big. I'm trying to see if you can see it. He said, but if I don't give feedback in real time, it gets bigger and bigger and you build the laundry list that Andrew was talking about and then you're telling them 17 things and your emotions are all bottled up and then you ex and then you can explode so if you deal with it in the moment and just take that risk and be respectful in it right so I'm not saying call them up and give them a piece of your mind that's not what I'm saying I am just saying take the risk and be in real time um, because it can build and then is it what hold on it just scrolled it said beat set or b8 maybe that's the last name. If conflict is not addressed, resentment will form. And that's even worse because it poisons the relationship. Absolutely. So let's pull those weeds up as they occur in our garden and don't let them take hold. So be uncomfortable, take the risk, use one of the four scenarios that we talked about, personalize it, use humor, use your nonverbals, whatever tool you have to use in that moment to stretch yourself a little bit. And each time you're going to notice that your conflict management muscle is going to be on diesel and you're going to have a six pack of ads for conflict management as you use that muscle. I'm not there yet. I'm just going to keep working out. And that leads me to be a disruptor. If you're on a team and you can sense that the conflict is building, don't be afraid to call it out and say, you know what, guys, I'm feeling like we're not all on the same page. Might we pause and talk about what we're truly, what the issue is, right? Be the disruptor. Don't be, you know, it's like the airport. See something, say something. And if you're not comfortable saying it in the group, then pull people, pull someone aside. But don't let it fester. Like, a, like they said, don't let it build up because it, it poisons the relationship. So be the disruptor. A couple of things. Um, I am probably a bit on the way disruptor side, like my disruptor skill is on 10, like I will just blow stuff up or I will pull things out, right? I will pull weeds out of the garden. So in this picture, you can even be the disruptor that's going to break open the wall. You're going to bust open the wall because it is just that important. If someone's life is on the line, if there is a safety issue, if there is a financial crisis issue, sometimes you have to just call a spade a spade and call it out there. But then there are times when you can be that patient, quiet disruptor. 
and be the voice in the wilderness and decide on your team, you know what, I'm going to be the person that's observing and making sure that we're all getting our say so in the meeting. And so sometimes I sit in meetings, believe it or not, and I'm quiet. It happens. It absolutely happens. Because what I'm doing is I'm observing and I'm trying to see who's not talking. I'm trying to see what the nonverbals are. And then, and, and if I am leading the team, I always speak last with my team. If I'm not leading the team, I may meet with the team leader in advance and say, hey, might I play a different role today? Might I be the person that redirects the conversation as needed? So sometimes being that disruptor can be the boom factor or it can be the really quiet voice. But be a disruptor, call out the conflict when you see it. Absolutely, we learn and grow when we face uncomfortable situations. Absolutely, absolutely. Be uncomfortable and force yourself into those growth modes. And, the, and my last one on this is stay curious. I am, while I, while I am in HR and my most recent uh, experiences all are in HR, I will get into the marketing team's business. I will get on a sales call. I will drop into the manufacturing plant. I will go into the safety meeting. And it's not because I don't have a, a ton of work to do. It's because I'm curious. I'm curious about how people get their work done. And if you can adopt a philosophy or attitude of curiosity when dealing with conflict, it will disarm, it could disarm you because you're no longer taking it personal. You're like, I wonder why we're in conflict. And that's an okay question to say. Maybe you don't know why. And maybe that's something you ask the other person. Do you even know why we're beefing? Like, what's the real issue? And you can be funny with it, right? So stay curious when you're feeling that angst come in. Stay curious. Ask some open-ended questions. Those can be your best friends. Marcy, go right ahead. So I know you said you didn't want to talk about the Eagles, but what I saw in, in the Eagles games was a breakdown in trust. It seemed like the coaching staff didn't trust and then the team players didn't trust each other. And so that kind of broke down their performance over several games. So if you're in a team and the trust breaks down, how can you have conflict management then? Oh, listen, you, you, that's a whole other lecture right there, Marcy. You, that's <laughs> a whole lecture series right there. So if the trust has eroded or the trust is falling apart or there's one person that's not trusting another, how can you still work through it? And that's a couple of ways. That's when you might want to pull one person aside. And if you can go after the person who's being most verbal or you can go after the person who's most influential in the team. So it really depends, right? You've got to kind of know your context and really just talk to them and say, hey, Let's talk about what our common goal is. We want to win the Super Bowl one more time while Veronica's still in Philly. Please, <laughs> we'd like to win the Super Bowl. Let's be clear. If that's our goal, what do we have to do? Well, we've got to win the, we've got to win the game. Okay, so to win the game, what do we need to do? And it's almost like the five whys, if you guys have heard of the five whys, why, 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 why. You're going to keep asking what's the most common basic goal we can get to. So when the Super Bowl, we've got to win the we got to win the division um, division games. To win that, you got to win most games. To win the game, what do we got to do? To make our defense better, to make our offensive line better. So you keep trying to find the most commonest goal, and eventually, when you find that goal, it's going to build that trust just a little bit because now you're working towards the same goal. And then after you're like, okay, if we can do that, then you'll build another trust step. Right. So sometimes it's about getting back to those goals. It's about being curious. It's about saying, hey, I feel like we don't trust each other anymore, guys. What's going on? Being vulnerable, taking that risk, and then being ready for people to say how they really feel and not take it personal. What do you think about that, Marcy? That's awesome. Thank you. I hope you're around next year. <laughs> Listen, I think we should call the Eagles. I think we they they have enough. As a matter of fact, I know the head of HR at the Eagles. We may have to call them and give them some consulting hours around some team building. They, they're going to need it because they I, that my jersey is just in a closet, just going to be dry clean for the season. Now it's a mess. But anyway, we're not going to go there. All right. So I know we're getting close on time. So that was it, right? So if we think about conflict management, we think about there's various types of conflict. We talk about how we can desensitize it, how we can make it less personal. We talk about developing a goal. We talked about, hey, be authentic, be clear, be intentional, take the risk, right? Ask the questions, be curious. 
all those things. If you put all those things into your little toolbox, just pull them out as you need them. Not every situation is going to need a hammer. Not every situation is going to need a flathead screwdriver. Not every situation is going to need a socket. But if you start to apply those tools as you need them, you'll notice that your conflict management skills are getting that much stronger. If you want to connect with me, we can connect via LinkedIn. I am happy to always connect and chit chat. Um, I don't like talking on the phone, believe it or not, but I am happy to exchange an email uh, when we do those things. And again, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for every person that spoke up tonight and shared and typed in the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Leslie, Andrew, Terrence, which one? <laughs> I can... Uh... Up in here, I just wanted to thank you again so much from for from all of us. Um, this was great, this, and and I think some of these, the questions and topics could definitely we we could go on and on. Um, but thank you so much for for your insight, your expertise. Um, there is a feedback link in the chat, um, so we also we would love your feedback. Um, if you could take a minute to complete that. And then we're just going to also take a minute to highlight a couple of upcoming events before we end it. Keep a heads up. There's going to be some information about um, we, we're going to have a speaker from USLI um, about uh, bringing your authentic self, right? Authentic self to work. Uh, we're also having a, uh, a career changers uh, panel. That's another collaboration between uh, the CME, uh, the Center for Male Engagement, and the um, Center for Career and Professional Development. So we're collaborating again on uh, that panel discussion for career changers. At the end of February, there's going to be an etiquette luncheon. Keep a heads up for that. Uh, in March, there's going to be uh, the annual Women in Leadership um, panel discussion. Uh, and also in March, there's going to be a speaker uh, panel on uh, cyber crimes and cybersecurity, um, specifically in the world of uh, financial technology. And uh, rounding out, there's in April, there'll be a, an industry spotlight on HR and HR topics. Um, Terrence, any uh, upcoming events you want to highlight? Um, at this time, no. Um, mostly looking forward to uh, promoting these events once they are all approved and greenlit. But um, just keep your ear to the ground um, as correspondence will be coming out uh, via email um, for some via text. And um, you will see a lot of events coming through the pipeline very soon. But uh, thank you once again for this amazing partnership. Looking forward to more opportunities for the CME and the Career Center to be able to collaborate, especially when we have phenomenal presenters as Dr. Hawkins. This was great. This was great. And I... Um... One more quick thing. We do have our, our on-site career networking fair on May 5th. Sorry, May 1st, May 1st. We're going to have a few prep sessions, but we're going to have the, the on-campus, on-site career fair May 1st. Um, please, again, take a minute, if you could, to fill out the survey. And I can't, I can't thank you enough, Veronica. This was awesome. You're awesome. This was really great. And we really appreciate you sharing your time. Thank you, everyone, for coming out.